Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Welcome back, everyone, to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute, a podcast where we break down and celebrate the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. And our first inaugural entry into this Movies by Minute is Young Frankenstein. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Alan Sanders. I'm Walt Murray, your co-host. And joining us again, a wonderful actor, Adam Boyer. Adam, welcome back to our castle. Good to be back. I trust you approved of today's food items and everything we brought to your trailer. Makeup Girl took care of you and everything. Uh, I didn't get my green M&Ms. There were a couple of brown ones in there, but, you know, we we can work on that. All right. We hired some new, you know, staff, and they're they're, they're still learning the particulars of each of our characters. Right. And and the color blindedness probably didn't help either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're shooting this podcast in black and white. This podcast is in black and white, so all the M&Ms kind of look one color or the other. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then what am I getting so picky about? <laughs> well, we start off this minute, minute number 24, where Frau Bluka is finally going to say good night to a rather irritated now Dr. Frankenstein, Frankenstein. And we will end with a rather interesting, well, something going on in bed with the good doctor after a shot of a full moon and we hear a violin screech in the background. So let's get to it and start off with this, uh, with the rest of this conversation between Cloris Leachman's character of Frau Bluka and Dr. Frankenstein, right after she's tried to entice him with three different things that she could maybe bring him, she finally says goodnight, and Walt, when he snaps at her goodnight, she flinches. She does, and, you know, again, we're getting into this uh, interplay between these two, and there are some levels here that we don't see on the surface, but she definitely seems to care And I don't know whether, again, this is because she is the lady who runs the house or because of another relationship, but she really does react to his getting irritated with her. I do love those losses that she's taking. I wonder if she was directed that way or if that was just her idea of either showing us or misleading us. And I love that 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 could be a character choice. I do know that what she did say in an interview, that working with Gene, you wouldn't necessarily know how loud he would come out with his next line, whether he was going to give you one of those long pauses that you had to just sit in character and wait for it to come, or if he would just bite at you. And she said she was not expecting it to be as terse as it came out, and so that is a legitimate flinch on Cloris Leachman's part. But of course, that makes it look more real, Adam, and let's face it, we said this a couple of days ago, if your job is an actor, your job is to make sure people don't know you're acting. Yep. Has that happened to you on set where you can leverage like a real jump, a real scare versus having to pretend? We usually rehearse beforehand. I don't know if they didn't do that or if they changed it. They they were had the liberty to change the scene and change their reactions. Well, obviously, uh, Gene did. Mr. Wilder probably went decided he was going to make her jump this time or the last time before. And some stars can do that. I... I'm not quite at that place in my career where I'm allowed to scare people. I apparently terrify them at read-throughs when they don't know what they're going to hear, but after that, I guess they get used to me. (laughs) What I'm wondering with this is Gene did mix it up a little bit, but how do you, Adam, as an actor, if you have to be startled, if if something has to look a natural jump or scare when you have rehearsed and you know it's coming, how do you try to make it spontaneous on screen? It's funny, because I prepare everything, I go over it and over it and over it. I go through all four stages of learning, unconscious incompetence, all the way through to unconscious competence. So I I consider myself more of a magician. Uh, It's not my job to feel what's going on. It's my job to make you feel what's going on. Basically, I plan everything until I get it just the way I like it. And then I show up to set and they change everything. (laughs) (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah, that's Hollywood to a T. Do it exactly act, like the script the, says, but nothing like the way the script says. Yes. I actually just uh, just wrapped a film, and I hadn't had this happen to me. You know, I, they've given me things to do, but I showed up to set, and I thought it was going to be sitting in a booth, not even looking at each other, shooting the film like the script said. And he said, no, what we're going to do now is I want you carrying a bag of wings in one hand and a drink in the other, and you're going to open up the 
car door that it's going to be in. You're going to sit down. You're going to pull out your tablet with one hand, flip through some pictures, hand them the tablet, take a wing out of the bag, eat the wing, then take a drink while you're telling this story, then put the bone from the wing back in the bag, take another sip, grab your tablet back, and then take the money. And I'm counting how many things I have to hold. And I'm now up to four with my two hands. And then get out of the door and get out of the car. It was the first time in 20 plus years I've had script continuity come up to me and say (laughs) anything, really. But they did come up and say, okay, so let's make sure you're eating the wing, not just with your right hand, but you're taking the bite on this part of the story when this word comes out and on this one. Wow. Now, how do you not look mechanical trying to keep that much detail in in the back of your mind? You just how many like did they give you time to rehearse it when they made that change pretty much on the fly? Not really. We were shooting the rehearsals. Yes, I rehearsed it, but we shot it. So yeah, it was it was uh, it was. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, but that's everybody would do it if it was. The character, it did change the character for me, was this cool private investigator that was like this badass ex-military kind of guy who was laid back and cool in my mind. And then I got there and I'm a wing-eating, storytelling guy. So it changed It changed the dialect and the character. So it changed my tempo from being kind of a slow, laid back guy to kind of one of them race car driver talkers, you know, talking fast. It, it was just a complete overhaul, really. Well, somebody did their research on private investigators because that is basically our diet is uh, chicken wings and uh, (laughs) sugar-filled, caffeine-filled drinks, half the time talking while we're eating. So they they nailed us pretty good. Oh, good. Well, I hope I did you proud on this one. (laughs) It sounds like you did. (laughs) (laughs) I think one of the hardest things for someone who's not an actor, when I got dropped in the middle of a movie and they said... Try to act, you know, when when the camera's on you in this scene, you need to look surprised. Look like you're looking at 9-11 happen. It was a spaceship crashing in the scene, which we did not know. But they said, you know, in your mind, think about watching 9-11 happen and have that reaction. And for me to have to consciously think about, here's what my face needs to look like, or here's how I need to, to act, I found that I'm not very emotive. And um, I, I, don't, I don't give away a whole lot. So I really had to work at that. And uh, it's interesting seeing her in this scene and the way that she does react to it. And I guess now I'm not as uh, surprised that it was an actual shock to her that he was being that loud and that firm when she wasn't expecting it. When we continue this minute here, we're in minute number 24, and Frau Bluka, rebuffed by the good doctor, picks up her unlit candelabra once again, says goodnight and heads toward what looks like the doorway, but just coming into frame and a little out of focus is the portrait hanging of Victor Frankenstein. It's interesting because she pauses at the picture. It comes into focus as she closes in and she does this quick look over her shoulder to see, is he looking at me? And we recognize through editing, of course, we cut to a different view of Dr. Frankenstein back to now unloading his luggage. He's unpacking, getting ready to settle into his room. Adam, there's a beautiful shot here, and I love this, the framing and the composition of this shot. She looks over her shoulder. We cut to Gene Wilder's character unpacking. He's not paying attention to her exit, but there is an oval mirror on a stand where we see her looking back at him. So we'll be able to see what they're both doing, even though they're on opposite sides of the room. Lovely. That's insightful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know you know how they did that. No, how? The mirror's reflective. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, you mean that's a real mirror? <laughs> It's an interesting device to be able to to look at two completely different parts of the room all at once and almost have a, a view into two totally different scenes at, at once. But his expression here is awesome as we move forward in the way he's, you know, first kind of not paying any attention and then all of a sudden completely shocked by what he sees. Well, what I love about it is it gives us a chance to, I mean, it's it's staged. It's obviously it's staged, but in a way that we forget it. It's almost like the mirror in Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're in the tent and Marion's going to change and, you know, our, our, our good friend Belloc is getting ready to pour a drink and seduce Marion or whatever he's about to do as a Frenchman. He sees the mirror and like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm catching her undressing. I wasn't expecting that. Here, we're seeing Frau Bluka. We're seeing the portrait of Victor Frankenstein. And yet, Gene Wilder is taking up the majority of the screen in the foreground, unpacking. So, we've got this very you know pedestrian activity of getting ready to unpack. But in the background, we see the mirror. And she now goes and begins to, I don't know, 
get amorous with the painting. <laughs> or at least friendly. Yeah, I'd call that friendly. I mean, she's basically like, looks like she's, uh, I don't know, whispering into his ear and kissing his cheek. And it's it's perfectly framed that it's almost like we're voyeuristically watching this act as if we're not in the room. Yeah, and then Gene right. Wilder catches it in, the, in his periphery as well. I, I think it breaks it up well. It makes it almost two different scenes, so you don't steal any of the intimacy between her and the painting, if you will. What I really like about, and this comes from being in film and loving movies and watching the cinematography, watching the camera and how it moves, Gene Wilder does the, a little bit over the top, but it's perfect, the jaw dropping, <gasps> like, oh my gosh, I just walked in on mom and dad or something mm-hmm. like that. And the camera yeah. does an immediate push in and the focus clears up as it basically brings in the mirror into full focus. And we watch Frau Bluka deliver a kiss to the cheek and we hear her saying, good night, Victor. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it definitely uh, opens the uh, the curtain on that relationship, doesn't it? Well, there's something going on here, without a doubt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And it, it, there's also kind of a peek a little bit into her sanity or lack thereof and her obsession with uh, Dr. the elder Dr. Frankenstein, because that's certainly not normal. We're, we're getting a peek into the craziness of this place. Adam, have you ever had a, a, a love scene with an inanimate object? <laughs> 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 I told you recently I gave my most romantic scene in the second movie I did to a C stand. <laughs> <laughs> Slapped a post it on it and went, That's Leanne. And I was like, No, Leanne is a very pretty woman. That's a C stand with a post it on it. <laughs> Testing all of your acting abilities. Yeah, exactly. It's funny you say that though, because. In real life, just getting back from camp, the reason I do Camp Sunshine and how I got involved was I lost one of my my good friends who was the musical director there. And so there's a radio station there that's got a plaque and it says his name outside. And whenever I go to Camp Twin Lakes, when I first get there and when I leave, I kiss his plaque. Not like, you know, not like in some weird way, but saying hello and saying goodbye and thanks for getting me involved in this. So, Walt, when you're saying that's weird, I was like, huh. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) When you go into an audition, you always have something in plan. So tell me something about yourself. So I usually tell people I'm president of the six foot two, 210 pound Jewish action hero guild. We're a very small demographic, but real powerful. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, remember the old Stephen Wright comedian joke about being on the bus? I get on the bus and this really hot Chinese woman comes over and sits down next to me and she starts saying, you know, I've, I'm an Asian nymphomaniac who gets turned on by Jewish cowboys. What's your name? Bucky Goldstein. <laughs> <laughs> the great Bucky Goldstein. Well, okay, let me ask you. You said, and I get the sentimentality, but do you kiss, kiss the plaque like with your lips, or do you do the thing where you like kiss your hand and then slap no. the hand on the? Kiss my fingers and tap it. You know, it's not like I'm making out with them. So then you really haven't had to like manhandle a, a portrait at any time so far in your acting career. Give me a sec. No, I don't think so. Well, because I, I will tell you, if you have, the people listening are going to post on Facebook and and correct you. I'm not going to say emphatically no. I'm going to say I don't remember. Here's the interesting thing with leaving us with this emotion where we're feeling a little weird and awkward. Gene Wilder gives us the, the, the look of a kid who stumbled in on his parents or something because obviously, or in this case, probably even worse, your grandparents. Your grandparents. Nobody wants to stumble in mm. seeing their grandparents doing something like that. So we've got this moment where we can't help but think the intimacy of the picture. We see the – and actually everything about this is about intimacy to a degree. It may be – some strange ways of approaching intimacy because we're eavesdropping through the mirror. We're hearing her whisper to the portrait. We see her kissing the portrait. It was right after she was trying to provide Dr. Frankenstein, the Ovaltine, the brandy, the milk. So there's a sense of intimacy in this room that's happening. I like it because it bridges into we dissolve to the full moon. We, it comes back up, we fade to black, come back up to a full moon. And now we're in, in the bedroom again and the camera does a slow push in and We can't help but now draw this natural bridge. We were talking all this intimacy, this picture, the kissing. He seems like he's enjoying his dream, at least at this point. Yeah, you have no idea what the heck's going on here. Or he doesn't want to be enjoying it. 
Yeah, which uh, seems to be uh, seems to be where that's going. Well, and, and I cannot help. My, this is where, and this is where I'm still 16, and I will be forever. Well, I guess I'm a male, so I guess we are all perpetually at a 16 year old boy's brain. But his sure. legs are spread and going wide, and he keeps kind of like doing these wide. And he's like, no, 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 not there, honey. No, wait, wait. I cannot help, but right now I am not thinking he's having a nightmare. Adam, what did you think about this when you first, uh, at least the first half, because this the minute ends before we realize going into tomorrow, into, into the next minute, that it actually is a nightmare, but it sounds like he's having a pleasurable dream, not a, not a scary one. Totally thought it was a sex dream, but once again, that could have been my adolescent mind as well. <laughs> Even when I was watching this uh, the other day, I was like, wait, w- what's going on here? Did I forget something? <laughs> so, well, did I miss this part? He's not saying, no, no, stay away. He's like, no, 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 no. I agree. It's it's not no like it's a safe word, like unicorn. <laughs> it's, no, oh, no, 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 don't. <laughs> Or maybe it's don't, don't stop. <laughs> Unicorns. <laughs> safe word. That's our safe word. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, Adam, that uh, that that uh, I have a whole new line of question at this point. Do you, as an actor, when you have scenes that may be more intimate or violent, do you do you guys use safe words to know the difference between saying no in character? And saying, wait, wait, you're truly choking me. Stop it. No, I, I'm not. A, like I said, I'm not a method guy. So I've, I've never had that situation where I put anybody in danger with what I was doing. So no safe word. As far as being intimate on camera with girls and whatnot. Yeah, that's that's just it's that's a whole different kind of awkward. But what about in terms of like, you know, how do you know that the other actor needs you to stop versus them in the character themselves? If they're yelling, stop, no, leave me alone. How do you work that out? I know there's rehearsal, but at some point, sometimes the emotion yeah. of the scene takes over and you got to be careful sometimes. I've worked with actors who, you know, I got I got body slammed on stage every night. Now, you're supposed to sort of not really body slam, but this guy would get so worked up that at one point I said, dude, you don't actually have to throw my ass to the ground. I think you broke my elbow last night. You know, I mean, some people really get into it. So, like, how does that work? Or have you had to experience that in your career so far? I've never had a problem with that. Um, I've, I've done a lot of stage combat and, and uh, even been a stunt choreographer for certain things. And the most, I guess the closest I would have ever gotten to that is this, the, I did the, the reckoning where I'm being held down by about 20 people. And I don't care. I was essentially being held down by a, a lot of extras and then like the two stunt coordinators. But you can be the toughest guy in the world and think you're the strongest and there's you can fight out of situations. But when you have 20 people holding you down like the director was saying well you know kind of kick your legs i said ruckus i can't kick my leg i have a thousand pounds on my leg i can't move my legs in any way right now so the claustrophobia of it made me a little anxious for a little bit but i've never had a situation where i had you know where i needed like anybody to move or get up or do anything and i've never hurt anybody in that kind of a way because like i said i'm not method so i'm not actually choking anybody i did I did have a scene once where I came in and I break a girl's arm. And I, when we were rehearsing it, I was kind of pulling it, pretending to hit her. And I wasn't actually hitting her with my elbow, but even me just kind of grabbing her wrist and pulling her arm out, and straightening it so I could hit it bothered her. So in between takes, you know, when she said, hey, when cameras, you know, on you, if you cannot go through those motions because my arm's getting a little sore, I went, yeah, sure, no problem. I don't need your arm there as long as the camera's flipped around past it. So that's the only situation I guess I got anywhere near having a problem with that. So all the stuff I know about safe words is imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> just read it somewhere. I just picked unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> that works for us, man. That works for us. Well, we are we're we're gonna end this minute where we're trying to decide exactly what kind of dream young Dr. Frankenstein here is having in his bed. But at this point in time, it's obviously much later in the evening. We get the shot of full moonlight. Well, this is one of those interesting moments that we're going to end the minute with. We hear the violin also coming in. I thought this was part of the soundtrack, which we'll find out in the next minute. 
It's not. It's it's literally there. So that's, I think, another interesting little thing that keeps playing with the audience where we're so used to music in the background that we don't think of it as having been actually there. Yeah, and this music plays a huge part in uh, where the movie's going. Uh, and we'll see him react a little bit in a minute. Which makes me wonder, is the music causing the nightmare? Is, is, it, is the music right now we see he's dreaming? We, we, I'm sorry, spoiler alert for Friday. Uh, it, it turns out that this is a nightmare, but does the music cause it? Because remember, I told you about the scene that was cut out. They, they had an earlier scene where Folkstein shows up and says, you're the, you've are the you been bequeathed this estate. And he says, I don't want anything to do with it. The next scene that they cut out was walking down the street. And all of a sudden, the same melody is being played by a violinist on a street. And at the very end of the scene, because it almost has a hypnotic effect on Gene Wilder's character to make him say, you know what, maybe I should go. It makes me wonder, you know, again, we're, we're hearing a musical cue. Is there something about the music and the Frankenstein genes, the genetics, that this almost has a hypnotic spell over over the Frankensteins? I'm looking forward to finding out. Adam, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, unicorn? <laughs> <laughs> Safe word. <laughs> well, he's fitting right in, isn't he? <laughs> I don't know on that one because I still thought he was having a sex dream. So. <laughs> 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 All right, well, as we go to wrap minute number 24 here of Young Frankenstein... We've been having Adam Boyer with us all week long so far. And Adam, I'd love to be able to close the week out with you. Do you feel like uh, coming back and playing one more time tomorrow? I think I can make that happen. That's awesome. We appreciate you and your agent working with us to fit you in your, your busy schedule. If, if people want to learn a little bit more about you or maybe the movies that you've been in, television shows, movies, whatever, where can people learn more about you? They can hit me up on IMDb or Facebook because I'm old uh, and Instagram because my son set it up for me. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Well, folks, look up his credits. To have somebody who's a true working actor that gives us a, a glimpse behind the scenes on how films are made and what goes on in actors' minds and how directors approach different things, it's, it's really cool to have that as we make our way through Young Frankenstein. Walt, if people want to learn a little bit more about us and this wilder ride we're on, how do they do that? Well, I guess because we're old, you can find us on Facebook, www.facebook.com slash the wilder ride. We'd love for you to join us, make some comments, ask any questions you might have for us. If there are some things in the minutes coming up that you want us to try to address, please feel free to uh, mention that as well. You can also find us on patreon.com slash the wilder ride. Or you can find us on Twitter and on iTunes, where we'd love if you'd give us a five-star rating and make a comment. That would be greatly appreciated and would allow other people to find us as well. All right. Well, until tomorrow, we find out what is this dream all about. If you want to stick around or come on back and play with us in the Castle of von Frankenstein. In the meantime, Unicorn. <laughs> Frankenstone. Frankenstone. <laughs> Frankenstone. <laughs> Frankenstone. <laughs> Frankenstone. <laughs> Frankenstone. <laughs> Frankenstone. <laughs> 